If you're deep into tech, especially stuff like video editing or video games, you probably understand a lot about frame rate. And frame rate is a really, really important thing when it comes down to the way we perceive our media. I actually did a video back in the past talking about monitors, and frame rate is a big part of this because it plays into our perception. Basically, long story short, it is the visual representation of how we end up seeing this virtual world and how we interact with the electronics that we have. And so it's important to have solid frame rates so that we can interact with them. And I kind of want to explain why, because I see a lot of misconceptions Especially every time I see an article that goes up, it's like, the human eye can only see 24 FPS, which is a bullshit lie. So basically today, I want to talk about why frame rate matters in video games. Michael here, welcoming you to Design View. So yeah, so today we're going to be talking about frame rate in video games, and this is... The reason I'm doing video games is specifically one, because I do a lot of video game stuff. That's kind of like what this channel is all about. But I also want to talk about video games specifically because they're a very special case inside the media we consume. And this is one of the reasons why we have a lot of misconceptions about it. And it's I feel like it's one of the reasons why a lot of casual people don't necessarily think about it all that much because video are pretty easy to kind of comprehend. I think a lot of people understand that videos are just a sequence of frames. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But video games specifically have a lot of differences to stuff like the other types of media, such as, you know, movies and stuff. There's a huge amount of differences, and we're going to go over those today. So first off, I'm going to kind of split this up into a lot of different sections. And if you understand a lot of the technical stuff, don't expect, like, huge advanced stuff. I might be able to go over stuff and, like, reinforce things that you've heard before. But I'm going to be keeping things fairly basic. That doesn't mean this is going to be a short video. I'm planning on making this a pretty long one because I want to explain things as well as possible without getting into a lot of the nitty gritty stuff. So if you don't understand tech all that well, don't worry, I'm gonna be keeping things fairly basic. So first off, we're gonna explain what frame rate is. So we're gonna be talking about frame rate and we're gonna be talking about what exactly it represents specifically in the terms of digital media. Now there is frame rate in other sort of medias as well, like stuff that isn't digital, but obviously we're gonna be talking about you know, frame rate as in a digital space. And then after that, we're gonna be talking about how it relates to video games and somewhat into videos you know, videos and um, things like interfaces and interactivity, like let's say your phone, for example, how you're using your AI, your UI and stuff. So I'll be talking about it mostly for video games, but somewhat we'll be talking about that. So we'll talk about three different sections of this. We're going to talk about the visual, which is going to be things like, let's say how you perceive it or how it looks and how it can change depending on the frame rating, et cetera, et cetera. And then we're going to be talking about the mechanical. This is going to be the kind of deep, kind of the code base essentially like the engine the way the program interacts when it actually has this frames and etc cetera, etc cetera. stuff like physics when you're talking about video games and then we're going to be talking about the most important part of this which is going to combine both the visual and the mechanical and then it's going to bring in the real life aspects which is called responsiveness I am terrible at spelling, by the way, so this is going to go great. But basically, responsiveness, if you are a hardcore gamer, you've probably heard this one a lot. And this is probably one of the most important things about frame rate when it comes down to interactive media, such as video games, or let's say interacting with your smartphone, going through the UI and stuff. Or maybe when you end up switching channels on your TV remote and you're going through the different channel browsers or whatever, frame rate plays into all of this. So let's go ahead and get into it. So first off, what is frame rate? So what? I'm, I'm not even trying to type it. I give up. I give up on spelling. Okay, so what, what is frame rate? Frame rate is basically, it is a sequence of pictures that are sent to you at a specific rate. So if we have the word frame rate here, oh my god, I did not prepare for this. So we have frame rate. It is the rate at which frames are sent to a monitor or screen of some sort. So let's say you have your screen, whether it's a television or a monitor, it is how fast pictures will be displayed on this image for you to see. And there's a lot of technical details that go into monitors and TV specifically that I'm not gonna get into here, but that is basically what a frame rate is. It is how fast these images can display on that um, you know, device. So basically what kind of terms you need to know when you're talking about frame rate, basically FPS, which is going to be frames per second. And so 60 FPS is something you'll hear a lot in video games because that is currently our standard, although I would love it to be higher than that. 60 FPS is pretty manageable on any device that we currently have in the modern technology world. So 60 FPS is our standard for that. If you are into movies, you'll hear 24 FPS a lot. This is where the movie standard is. And the reason for that, I'll talk about a little bit later when we get into the visual section, but it's actually an outdated model because it goes back into film strip and why we actually had those cameras developed in the first place because they found that 24 is actually the bare minimal to actually see our, you know, visual 
uh, representation of movement. And so 24 FPS is the minimum. Now, if you're looking at TVs and monitors, you also see something like 60 hertz or 60 HZ or 120 or people like to talk about, you know, the elitist. They'll talk about 144 hertz and be like, I have a 144 hertz monitor. This is actually displaying or the display rate of a monitor. And so if a monitor has 100 or let's say 60, for example, it has a 60 hertz. This means it can display 60 FPS or approximately. Now, the reason it is hertz and not, you know, FPS specifically is the fact that 60 hertz can technically range between, you know, 58 and somewhere around like 62 ish frames per second, depending on how the monitor is built. And it's it's approximations because not everything runs perfect. And so basically when you hear 60 hertz, that basically means that that monitor can run at 60 FPS. So that's what frame rate is. It is a series of pictures that are sent to a monitor over and over again. So you have a bunch of images, it sends out one by one, you end up seeing it. And there's some transitional stuff that we'll talk about in the visual stuff, but essentially that is what your monitor will put out. And that is what you end up seeing. And it ends up making a perception of movement. Now you may be wondering how does the sequence of images actually make it display movement? And the reason for that, and there is gonna be some relevance to this, so don't think I'm going off on a tangent. So we have these frames that just show up over and over again. So we have a frame here and a frame here, and maybe there's a triangle in the middle or something along those lines. Now, how do we actually get this to appear like movement? Well, the idea is that naturally our eyes are basically a lens and it has kind of like a little cone at the back or cones at the back that ends up sending out little tiny transmissions to our brain. Now our eyes are working at light speed. They are always taking in input and sending signals to our brain. Now, whether our brain will actually respond to those or not is going to be up to the brain itself and what we actually want to perceive. But what it ends up coming down to is that we actually see an infinite amount of frames. We do not see in frame rate. And this is one of the reasons why seeing those articles that go up, that's like 24 FPS is the maximum eyes can see, which is complete bullshit. We can see at the speed of light. We literally see every single change that happens in front of us. The difference is that our brain has to perceive it. And if you are incapable of seeing above 24 FPS, you should quite literally see a doctor. I'm not joking about that. Actually go see a doctor because there are eye conditions that can happen where your brain is not receiving signals that it's supposed to, which is actually a serious condition. You should get that checked out before you go blind. But going into it, so how does this actually work? Well, since we're actually seeing, we just see a single image at all times from our eyes. However, these little cones in the back, they actually heat up and down depending on the amount of a color ray that they end up seeing. Now, I'm not going to get into the specifics of this, but basically all there's, there's all these different types of cones and they all see different colors. And so as they heat up, the intensity of those colors actually increases and decreases. And so as you end up seeing those colors, they wind up changing. Now, the way we actually perceive movement is the idea that these cones lighting up and down will cause different sections. So let's say it's up here. This is white and then this is white and then this is orange or something like that, then our perception will be like, oh, hey, this is slowly becoming white over here while this side is slowly becoming orange. And then it will slowly make that transition frame by frame, not frame by frame, but rather, you know, second by second as our brain processes this information. Now, how do we actually trick it with the frame specifically? Oh, I'm using the wrong color here. How do we trick it with a frame? Well, let's say we actually have an image over here. So we have three circles, right? And so we have one, two, three. So our eyes we'll kind of see this and we just see a plain image. Our eyes are just like, yep, there's a thing. There's just a bunch of light, right? Just coming at us. And it's a bunch of different colors and it is basically heat. Our brain will then perceive this and be like, oh, well, I can see very distinct objects. So there is one, two, three circles and maybe a triangle over here just for the hell of it. And that's a terrible triangle, but whatever. Now, how do we perceive movement? Well, naturally, like I said, we would actually see a smooth progression. So you would actually see this circle. Let's say this, circle number three was going to move down here or something. You would actually see it slowly move over and then we would have a transition to where it would slowly fade in and out. However, pictures don't work that way. So in frame one, you would actually see the three circles and you'd be like, all right, that's pretty normal because yeah, that's what it is. And that's how we would perceive it realistically. However, let's say the circle moved over here all of a sudden. And then this circle is no longer here. So, you know, it's just kind of, it's, you know, our brain still knew it was there. It's called object persistence, I believe. 
However, now there's a third circle here, and we perceive it and be like, oh, hey, there's a new circle there. And so basically, when we end up going in there, we'll be like, all right, well, this circle that was here is no longer there. However, this circle is logically within the proximity that this circle could end up moving. And therefore, we will kind of associate it and be like, oh, hey, there we go. And there's a lot of visual trickery that you can end up doing to kind of trick our brains into not doing this properly. And that's topics for other videos. But this is the basic idea. Now, again, this probably sounds like a tangent, and I've gone on for quite a bit explaining how frame rate works and how we're able to perceive images and change it into our eyes. But this actually plays into a huge part of responsiveness, which is going to be incredibly important. Anyways, now let's go back to our original thing. So that's frame rate, and that's how frame rate ends up working. So let's go ahead and go into the visual aspect. Now, visually, how is frame rate works? Obviously, it's a bunch of images. So we just end up getting an image, and then we have another one, and it displays in a row over and over again. Now, there are different types of media. There is, you know, the linear types of media, such as video, for example. And this is where a lot of misconceptions come into play, because we know that video is just a string of images. And so when it comes down to a video, you have these squares. I'm just going to use circles because they're easier to draw. Um, but you have these this line and all your video player has to do is decode each frame. So it decodes one frame and then it decodes another, and then it just sends the frames as they're decoded, or maybe it'll decode it in advance and store it in memory. And then it displays them. Now there are a few advantages to having video in the fact that, you know, you have videos at 24 FPS, but then if you play a game at 24 FPS, you might notice it looks a little bit different and it just doesn't look right. It looks very stuttery. So if I go ahead and throw up game footage on here, I'll show it at 60 FPS and you'll be like, oh, hey, you know, that looks smooth. Hopefully you're watching the 60 FPS on YouTube or wherever I else I end up uploading it. Um, but, you know, when you end up dropping it down to 24, you'll notice that all of a sudden it doesn't feel as smooth. And if I do a side by side comparison, it's very easy to see the difference as long as you're watching the video at full frame rate. And so you end up looking at that and be like, all right, well, why does a video like look fine at 24 FPS in comparison to a game. The reason for this is video has what's called prediction, or rather it is able to predict the next frame when it goes into editing and it has the perception just like our eyes do. So we end up going up here. Remember those little cones, cameras kind of work the same way. So when you go into live video, for example, our um, frame, <laughs> I didn't plan this out very well. Sorry for that. Uh, prediction. There we go. I, I'm sure somebody can read that. I can't, but I'm sure somebody can. Um, but so basically what they end up doing is that in between frames, they're able to predict what's going to happen in the next frame. And therefore, what you can apply is motion blur. So let's say there is an object here and then this object is going to move over here. What the frame can do is it can blur this image so that it looks like, oh, hey, this is in the process of moving. And they're able to do this for every single frame. This is also helped out by the fact that a camera, when it ends up perceiving something, it does the same effect our eyes do, as in it will slowly transition between them. And then when it captures the frame from the lens, it will slowly get rid of that motion blur. And then all of a sudden we're left with just a circle here. And so it doesn't work exactly like our eyes. There's a lot of complex stuff that goes into it, but that is essentially how that works. Video games can't do that. In fact, any rendering can't. So the difference between video is the fact that it can predict what the next frame is. And this can also go into transitions and stuff like that. You end up watching movies to where it ends up fading out black or it kind of fades into a new frame. So you have one frame that's just like there's a circle here, but then like it's just slowly transitions in a triangle or a square over that circle and that circle slowly fades out. This is because, again, you're able to have those future frames. And so you can fade one frame out in front of another or behind another. And so you can make it so that it appears as if they're transitioning smoothly and this again helps with the low frame rate because you can make it so that something that is normally only perceivable by the eyes in you know light speed you can then transition that into a lower frame rate why doesn't this work with video games or rendering rendering can't see the future and therefore it has to render every single frame individually so how rendering works is you have you know a frame but a frame isn't what a video frame is. A video is going to be an encoded amount of data. And so you have all this data, but that data represents an image. So when you decompress it, it is going to be the same image every single time. So you'll have this image of a triangle and it will be exactly that same triangle every single time. So when your video player decodes it, it already has that frame. So this data is already that frame. 
when you render, you have no idea what that output is. You're going to go to your monitor and the monitor, if you just had a raw frame, it's going to be like, what the frick do I do with this? It's just a bunch of data. It's just a bunch of vectors. It's a bunch of image data. It's a bunch of asset locations. It has no idea what to do with that because a frame is specifically a bunch of different assets thrown in together. Now, why is this important in frame rate? That's because each frame has to be rendered individually. And so when you end up getting this sort of mesh of assets, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this for space reasons. Um, you end up having your GPU, your CPU. I said that weird. I don't know why. And then your memory. And that, I'm going to simplify it to that. It will take in all of these assets and then output a frame that is then going to be what you see. And so it would be like, oh, hey, we have a triangle, a circle, and a square. It will then be like, oh, the square is the ground, the triangle is some sort of tree, and then the circle is the sun, or something along those lines. And then it would, you know, have its post processing, et cetera, et cetera. And so all of a sudden we have a scene of a tree. Then it has to do it again. So you go from your kind of rendered scene. So this will come out from whatever command it had. So your CPU would be like, oh, hey, render this scene out or something along those lines. It would go through this process, output the frame, then the frame would go to the monitor at whatever refresh rate it has. And there's a bunch of other sort of technical details that go into how monitors display frame rate, but I'm not going to get into that because this video would be hours long. Then it jumps back up to the top and re-renders the frame. So it basically cycles through this over and over and over again for every single frame. If you're running something at 60 FPS, it does this 60 times per second. Now, why is this relevant? It's relevant because you have no idea what the next frame is going to be. You don't have the sequence. The sequence is all of a sudden cut off. You have one frame. You cannot predict what happens in the next frame. Therefore, you can't apply things like motion blur, and you don't have the natural fading effect that your eyes would. So when you have these cones and they're slowly fading in colors, you don't have that effect whatsoever. Therefore, you don't have the illusions that would be applied to 24 FPS. Therefore, instead, it's much easier for your eyes to see a single image. Since you don't have things like blurring, you don't have things like extra positioning, you don't have transitions. You have just a frame. Now, there's a lot of tricks that we end up doing, especially at 30 FPS, to end up making this sort of work. And we do have motion blur in video games. However, it's not predictive. Um, it is, or as, rather than, it is predictive. It is not, you know, pre-built and it can look at the next frame to produce it. Instead, it is predictive. And there are technologies that are predictive. There are um, settings inside your GPU that can render an extra frame. However, the problem with that is it goes into responsiveness, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But essentially, it ends up increasing the response time that is required. And therefore, it will render, like if you want to talk about this specifically, it will render an extra frame and use that extra frame to enhance the last frame. And then it will re-render the next frame while predicting the frame after that, which is incredibly inefficient, extremely rarely used, and it makes input lag absolutely terrible. So that's the visual representation. That's why frame rate is important because what you need is a solid sort of image to actually send to your eyeballs. And so the faster that this frame rate is, the more images you're going to get and the crisper and cleaner it will be. Because we don't have those visual trickeries, we can't trick our eyes into seeing motion. And therefore, we need higher frame rates to actually see things more like stable and 60 fps is considered a standard in the scene because basically that is a very fluid amount because after that you get very diminishing returns however when you go down to 30 fps it is very easy to see when things are kind of going down again i'll show up that footage it will it's very easy to see when something is at 60 fps in comparison to 30 fps as long as you're watching this video at full um, frame rate now let's go ahead and go into the mechanical stuff. Now this is going to go a little bit more into the technical details. So we've covered visuals. Let's go ahead and go into mechanical. This is going to be stuff that I'm not going to go too advanced in this. I'm going to be very, very quick in this section just because it goes way into a lot of engine type stuff that is just not really relevant. But let's go ahead and talk about it. So first off, you know, you have these frames and they go up, you know, frame, frame, frame. I think I've repeated that at least 20 times in this video and that's perfectly fine. But video games have logic. And rendering does as well, technically. But we have a lot of different data that we have to pass through when it comes down to different types of frames. And so let's say you have a basic frame. So you have a frame and you have, let's use that example from before, we have this tree and then we have a sun. Now, the sun itself is not going to be illuminated until we run the code to actually illuminate it. And this actually goes into our little CPU mem thing here. I accidentally rotated my palette. <laughs> I didn't even notice. Um, 
Well, that looks wrong now. Anyways, we don't actually have lighting inside of our assets. And so what it has to do is it has to process that information, which means the higher the frame rate, the more kind of lighting it has to do. But that's not what's specifically important. What's specifically important is logic. Now, logic is an important thing in all video games. It's how it basically runs. It's how it takes an inputs. It's how it um, determines damages, numbers, every single variable, such as AI, for example. Let's say, you know, you play a game and you have an AI that's walking forward. It has to kind of transition it. Let's say movement, for example. The way things are rendered on a scene is it is, let's say, a 3D rendering, for example. It's going to have, you know, an object and it has all these vertices. Each single frame, it has to move these vertices around and it has to calculate where they're at. Now, this ends up going to game logic because game logic will have to know where these vertices are or where these objects are. Let's use a 2D sprite, for example. You have a 2D PNG or whatever. I don't remember what image they end up using to represent that, so we'll just do that. So you have a PNG or whatever, and that is your object. Let's say you're using hit detection, for example. Now, at a lower frame rate, or at a higher frame rate, I should say, is you would have two objects and they would interact intersect so let's say you have two circles going up one is going to be x one is going to be y because why not and so basically they're headed straight for each other and they're going to be running now at a high frame rate when these two circles end up meeting each other it will be like oh hey you two touched each other we're going to end up causing a collision but what if your frame rate is low let's say this happens in one single frame so this is one frame this is another frame in between these two frames right so let's say it's one frame to where they're not touching, and then the next frame, they are touching. What if your frame rate is too low? Let's say, and then they're, you know, obviously they're headed off. So this is X, Y, X, Y, uh, the chromosomes, and then um, this would be Y, and then we would have X over here. So, but let's say you didn't have a high enough frame rate to see this frame specifically. Let's say this was just canceled out. All of a sudden, X and Y just went by each other without ever once touching. This is where game logic kind of has a lot of problems with frame rate. Now, obviously, we have a lot of predictive technologies nowadays, and it does approximations. And so it would be like, oh, position A is here, and then position B is here. These two would have had to cross at some point, and therefore the intersection point would have been here. And then it would then run its calculations based on this next frame and be like, this is what we should end up doing. So when physics ends up going to play, it would predict, oh, hey, it would collide here. And then it would be like, oh, it would bounce off into this next frame. And so X and Y would then bounce off each other backwards after their little collision here because i don't know they're terrible drivers or something like that and then x would just fling back to where it was and then y would fling overwards however in older games and other technologies you have to have that center frame or else collision is not there and this is one of the reasons why frame rate is important when it comes down to game logic and a lot of developers are still tying their frame or their game logic to frame rate so for example let's say dark souls they had a uh, weapon degradation based off of um, how long it was inside of an enemy. Therefore, every single frame that it was inside the enemy would count as one. And so you would have one, 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 in comparison to the frame rate that was slower, it had one, 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 one. And so you ended up having two times when you were running at two times the speed rather than one times, which was their intended rate. And again, this is a terrible way to like program your games however it is incredibly important and there's a lot of ways that you can't really get around this especially when it comes down to physics and there's the kind of idea of approximations so let's say we have a ball and it is bouncing towards a flat surface i said i wasn't going to get advanced in here and here i am fucking explaining physics but basically so the ball would project that it would bounce off of the surface but if your frame would have it go here you would have two options. One, you could either predict off of where you're at, but the more you have to predict, the less accurate it's going to be. So if you have predictive at 30 FPS, the ball could end up up here rather than at the proper 60 or 120 FPS or whatever it was designed to be, it would technically have to be here. And so you would want it in the proper position. So if you actually have a lower frame rate, you're going to have worse and worse prediction because the amount of data that is thrown into that prediction is going to be less and it is going to be less frequent. And you can end up running into a lot of physics bugs. This also happens when you end up getting into too high of a frame rate because then the prediction uh, um, algorithms end up kind of botching themselves because they're like, oh, hey, we have too much data now and we don't know what to do with it. And so they can end up going into overload. So, for example, Skyrim is a great example to where if you end up turning up the frame rate too high, horses can end up flying. It is hilarious and a thing that is not reprodu reproducible on all machines. But if you can accomplish it, it is absolutely hilarious. And that is because the physics algorithms is not capable of producing that higher frame rate 
which is another reason why a lot of developers end up locking frame rates. Now, why developers lock frame rates, I'll cover in another future video. But that kind of goes over the basics of why it's important on a mechanical level. Where am I on my <laughs> thing? I'm getting lost on my board. Um, so yeah, so we talked about mechanical, and now it all goes into responsiveness. This is the most important part, and this goes into literally every single interactive medium that we have, including UI design. If you are a UX designer or studied UX design at all, then you will know about responsiveness. It is incredibly important with all of the tech that we use. However, in order to order, in order to understand it fully, you need to understand these two specifically when it comes down to video games. So let's go ahead and find a clean spot somewhere. There we go, nice big clean spot. So here is responsiveness. I'm going to go ahead and spell it up here. Responsiveness. You wouldn't believe that English is my first language. Um, anyways, so we get responsiveness. This is where a lot of hardcore gamers kind of talk about frame rate. Now, we talked about the visual representation to where they can't really blend frames and it's much harder for it to trick your eyes into seeing motion because it doesn't have all the motion tricks that you would have on a normal camera and you can't kind of process what your eyes would already see with a camera. Instead, you just have a frame and frame so it looks much more like pictures and having it more quicker makes them look more fluid. However, that is definitely passable. I have played games at 30 FPS and been perfectly fine with it visually. It kind of hurts my eyes. I get eye bleeds after a while if I'm watching anything below about 50 FPS, and that happens in movies too. I hate it in movies. Um, but you have those frames. However, when I play a game at 30 FPS, I feel the responsiveness, and this goes into the mechanical. And so the visual side of it is that you are only going to see a single frame at a time and the time that it's gonna to take to get to your next frame is gonna be without inputs. And so when you make an input, let's say you push the A button on frame one, you're not gonna see the input of that until frame two. Now let's do some calculations here. So this is gonna seem really trivial. However, let's go into it. So you have 60 FPS. Now this means there's gonna be 60 frames per second. So we have one, divide it by 60. I'm freaking screwing up on my drawing here. I apologize. But you have 60, so we have 60 here. Now 60 is going to go into one about, I think it's, you know, 0.167, right? About 167? It's like 1 1.6 or 0.16 continuous, I believe. But 1.67 is what we're going to stick with because that is kind of manageable. So we have 1.167. This is the amount of milliseconds, I believe it's milliseconds, hopefully that's right, um, between each frame. This means that, you know, it's going to display 60 of these. Your responsiveness won't be seen until this, but that's not all, because your monitor also has a response time. So if we go into this, we have our monitor here, and let's say you have a decent monitor at 5 ms delay, right? So we're going to have that, you know, 0.167 plus 5. Now, we're looking at 21.7. This is your standard kind of phone delay. And so there's 0.21 seconds between every single frame, or 0.22 if I want to summarize it or um, estimate it, et cetera, round it. There we go. That's the right word. I'm not a mathematician here. Um, but so you end up having this delay every single time. Oh, there's supposed to be a zero here, isn't there? Yes, there is. Um, anyway, so <laughs> I'm not a mathematician. I apologize. But you have this delay between every single frame. And this means when you tap a button, you won't see that input for another frame. And then you have on top of this, you also have the game code that we talked about over here to where let's say it's predicting stuff. So it'll take in an input from one frame and then it will have to you know, kind of calculate that. Let's say it has some sort of smoothing. And so it'd be like A was pressed here. Start action. So start A. And then for the next frame, I ran out of room. I did this in a terrible spot. It would be like frame one or EX. I'm just going to do EX one or EX two and then execute, right? So you would have the full execution several frames afterwards. This is where input lag comes into play because the sooner you can actually see the next frame, the quicker you can react to it and the quicker your inputs will take to actually take action. So for example, let's say you end up going into your code and you're like, okay, I want this action of a to end up being immediate so it'll be like okay it'll be in the next frame the problem is you're going to have this delay here between each of these frames that is, is that right no there isn't a zero there god damn it 
<laughs> this is why I don't do math in these videos. Um, so yeah, you end up having that delay. Now let's say it's not 60 FPS. 60 FPS is standard. That doesn't seem too bad, right? You know, you're able to react fairly quickly. Is that right? No, what the? I, I don't know anymore. I'm just an idiot. <laughs> um, so you end up having your 60 FPS, right? Let's cut that in half. Let's go to 30. Then you have one divided by your 30. And then doing math here. So you're going to go to 0.33 continuous. All of a sudden, you've doubled your kind of frame rate there, isn't, or your delay there. And so it ends up going up higher and higher. And so this delay between these frames gets higher and higher. And so you can actually get up to, let's say, 24 FPS. You're only displaying 24 frames per second, which means that you're only able to respond 24 times per second. You're only able to put in 24 inputs per second because your eyes can't perceive the frames that don't exist. Now, this goes into competitive gaming as well, because let's say, you know, there's a corner here and there's a guy with a gun. I don't know. He's like, I'm going to kill you. And so he's standing there, right? Now, let's say, you know, this guy has a higher frame rate than you. He's going to see you behind this wall, kind of hiding with your gun before you're going to see him with his gun. This is another reason why frame rate is important, because he's going to see it. Let's say he's at 144 or whatever. He's going to be able to get a few milliseconds ahead of you. He's going to be able to see you first, and therefore he's going to be able to pull the trigger first, theoretically. Now, obviously, your brain has time to process, and it could end up going into display stuff. But if he has several milliseconds that he sees you beforehand, he's able to actually react to that very much quicker. So if you end up going into, um, you know, competitive gaming, you want higher frame rates because it allows you to react to things quicker. And there's some things to do with like latency if you're talking about online games. But in general speak, that's kind of how that plays out. But what about button inputs as well? You know, you can end up adding this again. Since he's able to see you, he's able to input things quicker. And since he's able to input quicker, then there's more frames. He's able to execute that input into the code quicker, which means that he will also be able to shoot faster. Therefore, you're dead, most likely, as long as you're equally skilled. But if you're not equally skilled, then you can end up doing a bunch of other stuff. But that's the basics of it. And that essentially goes down to responsiveness. You know, if you're talking about UI design, for example, if you have a button on your smartphone, let's say you have a smartphone here, I'm going to use a square one, I guess it's a razor or whatever. So you end up having your smartphone here, and you have a screen. Now, let's say you have a button here, the responsiveness time is going to be when you tap that button, there's going to be a slight input delay for when you end up tapping something, correct? Like when you end up tapping, like let's say the volume control, it has to execute that code and then it gives you a responsive feedback, like a little circle that is a popping up or something along those lines. That is also going to be down to frame rate. Now, if your phone is only at 30 FPS, then it won't display it very quickly. However, when you end up using a smartphone, it feels like it's a little bit smoother, right? It feels like, let's say you end up swiping up, right? The transition feels fairly smooth most of the time, except for when it stutters here and there, depending on your phone. The reason for that is because it's at a higher frame rate and therefore it is able to smooth out those frames. Let's say it was a lower frame rate. Then you would click the button and then it would take a second or a few milliseconds to actually respond to that. And then it would take a few milliseconds to actually take action because then it has to process all that information that was from that button. Again, going into the responsiveness of it. And so it's not only important in just video games, but it's important in all forms of media. When it goes into like pushing the A button, it doesn't have to be an A button. This can also go into things like visual feedback when it goes into just watching stuff like this video, for example. Having this video at 60 FPS allows you to see how terrible I am at writing very much more efficiently because you have more frames of information. Therefore, if I end up just very quickly end up doing that, if you're at 30 FPS, you probably didn't see that get drawn. You just saw it appear. However, if you're watching it at 60 FPS, it's very easy to go frame by frame and see me actually draw that. And you can use this in so many ways in design. And I kind of want to do a full video on that in the future because it's incredibly important to look at and from a UX design standpoint, and it can just make everything feel more responsive. So if you're wondering, you know, why does frame rate matter in pretty much anything? It comes down to responsiveness. That is 100% the reason. And the re it's not just responsiveness from a perspective of like the person, but it's also responsiveness of the tech itself. It is responsiveness of the hardware. It is responsiveness of the software. The higher the frame rate, the more frames are able to push down to your hardware. The more it's able to look at the data and be like, okay, I can output this. The more resources it has to end up predicting things for the future. If we can get up to 144 hertz as standard, for example, we can start implementing things like actual predictive motion blur into video games and only have a 0.01 millisecond delay or something like ridiculous like that. Like 
it would actually be incredible. If we ended up having high frame rates on phones and things like that, the touch input would feel more responsive. We'd be able to interact with it better. When it goes into video delay, for example, like let's say you're sending data over the internet, you know, you have a normal delay when you end up going over the net. So we'll have the net here. And you end up sending data to your net friend. Oh, <laughs> that's an M, not an N. But you have your net friend. I, fuck it. <laughs> I give up. Um, so you end up having your friend net. And so they end up having a latency here, but if at a higher frame, frame rate, this latency will be slightly reduced and slightly improved because they'll be seeing the image as soon as it is sent rather than later than it is sent. Because when you end up sending data, of course, it has to also process those frames. For example, when you end up decoding from live video, for example, it actually has to decode those frames one by one and you have a delay for that. It has a delay from how long it takes to actually decode that frame. And when it goes into video games, for example, this is why streaming video games over the internet is so complex and painful is because it has an added delay into that responsiveness. So if we end up going over there, it's going to increase this value exponentially because of the amount of like network lag that you're going to have. And sooner or later, we'll get to, you know, improved internet and stuff, but not everyone has the fortunality of having that. But again, having increased frame rates not only improves video games, but improves absolutely everything we have. Obviously, it's not required for online video. If you're watching this video at 30 FPS, you probably don't care. 30 FPS is perfectly fine. 24 FPS for movies is kind of low, I would feel. I would prefer it to go higher, something like 48. Um, oh, I never talked about the reason they actually do that. Um, I'm not going to cover it, but long story short, um, they found that that is the lowest amount of frames that you can actually view on your eyes and actually have it perceived as motion. And we've improved that, so we can actually go down to 20 frames and actually have it look a bit better with the, all the techniques that we have. But 24 was found to be that lowest standard, and so they built cameras for that because it was cheap. Yep, they were trying to save money. But yeah, so basically, if you ever hear a PR guy say, oh, 24 FPS is where we're standing, yeah, or 30 FPS is more cinematic, tell them they're just trying to save money because they're assholes, because that's the truth. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe for more content like this one and my other styles of content as well. And if you have more to input into the framework, or maybe you have questions, or maybe there's something I ended up skipping over, or maybe there's videos that you want to see in more in-depth stuff about this. Sorry my mouth was so terrible in this video as well, because I'm... I'm not good at on the spot math, but I'm actually really good with like problem solving. So if you give me a second, then I end up solving everything out. But, you know, again, if you want to end up seeing other topics and stuff like that, make sure to suggest them. This is my new kind of idea about design view. I'm kind of going over like I just have a drawing board and then I go over it. I've been trying to do this in a few videos and I'll kind of go over it in a few other times. But I have other videos that are kind of in this format coming up as well. So if you want to check in those out, make sure to subscribe. Also, if you end up liking my content, you can check out my website at michaelpstandage.com. Link in the description. You can end up checking out my other types of content. It also has my blog that talks about what I'm doing and stuff like that. Don't update it very often, but I do update it enough that it has, you know, you can get a general idea of what I'm working on. And then obviously you can see my Twitter on there and other social media accounts. And then also if you like video games or you want to discuss the technical sides of frame rates, maybe then you can end up jumping into our gaming discord called the broken chat box link in the description as well. There we end up chatting around. It's not the most active place, but we end up kind of having in little discussions and we have gaming nights every single night. So if you ended up wanting to play video games with us at a high frame rate, preferably then go ahead and jump in. Anyways, like I said, thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video.